Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Nature of Aesthetics. Along with me is my panelist and discussant, Professor Mark Brennan. Mark is the professor at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He's also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Good to see you, Mark. Good to see you, Chris. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. This week, we're going to summarize the turmoil in Syria. So let's get to it. First, of course, right up there on the top of the news is the Syrian conflict and the government of Bashar Assad. And there's a clash, a clash between many types of groups. And so what are those groups? First, on one hand, we've got Russia and Iran. And they're supported by their clients, Hezbollah and the Shiites of the region. Of course, as everybody knows, the Hezbollahs are a terrorist, a group of terrorists. So on the other side, we have the rebels, uh, the, which is a, made up of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, not much can be understood whether or how secular or how religious they are. Uh, there's been some reports that they are secular, but I'm not so sure that we can believe these reports. Also, because they, we've got with them the Al Qaeda, another group of terrorists, and then we have uh, the backing of the government of Syria by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and of course the indigenous Sunnis in that region. So, why? Why the clash? Well, some might say it's, on one hand, you got the Sunnis and, and the Shiites, and they've been fighting forever. It's really pretty since 632 AD. So, why wouldn't this conflict be of that nature? It's possible. But the problem here is that fighting, belong, fighting beside the Shiites is Russia and Iran. Of course, Iran is a Shiite nation, nation predominantly, but Russia, Russia's here and supporting it all. So it doesn't quite add up. It can't be purely a Sunni versus Shiite uh, confrontation. Because on the other side, you've got Russia and Iran, you've got Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And so you've got the political element. Hmm. So we have to figure out, we have to go back in and ask ourselves, what are the motivations of man? Well, there it can be categorized in two broad, two broad categories. Okay. One is self-interest. And the other, of course, is ideology. In other words, thinking how others should behave, not yourself. Self-interest is how you behave, obviously. You're thinking of yourself first. But ideology, you think of others. So motivations pretty much lie within those two categories, yourself or outside yourself. But within those categories, we can find that there are, there are other. We can subdivide it. Self-interest can be subdivided into sex, obviously not part of this money or wealth. Okay, that's possible. On the ideology side, you've got religion and you've got politics. Politics is really another word for power. So in politics, but in politics here, we've got no government hegemony. In other words, Russia is not saying to the, the region you need to, or to the rest of the world, how they should behave politically. They're not bringing any particular political ideology to the, to the show. It's not bringing any communism or any words of free enterprise or whatever it is. They're pretty much 
it seems to be silent. So there's no telling about how others, about how others should live. So it's dubious that politics plays a role. You might say power. Well, maybe. Because there is the port, a free sea port, and Russia has always longed for a, a seaport outside of its northern ports, which are ice locked during the winter. And of course, uh, inside the, uh, the Black Sea, uh, which is, ha they have to go past the, uh, the Isthmus of, of Bosphorus. So, uh, which is a strategically not very advantageous to their naval strategies. So perhaps this port is playing a part in, the, uh, in their total role here in this clash. However, let's look somewhere else. Here in the self-interest category, we have wealth. Wealth is allied to money. I think this is where the key lies. This is a power play for money and wealth. Why is that? Because there are two pipelines or two avenues to export petroleum coming from Russia or coming from Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Saudi Arabia has, would like to export more to the uh, European, especially of gas. Uh, so would uh, Russia and Iran, a competing pipeline there for export. And obviously, this means wealth. And for Iran, it means being able to uh, supply money to their political am ambitions, such as their nuclear program. And for Russia, they can sell their natural resources. So, is it money, is it wealth? Let's discuss further and bring in our discussant, Professor Brennan, and see what he thinks. Professor, what do you think of the situation? I, I, liked, I liked your first proposition, which we've seen Russia act on since the early 19th century, the attempt to get a warm water port that cozied up with Turkey. They've tried this time and again throughout this region to get a warm water port. And when you look at Russia now and how China might start to box it in in the east, and Russia will have a heck of a time trying to defend that territory, a warm water port becomes all that much more important now. As far as money goes, I'm not so sure. But remember, Russia also, since 9-11, if you think we have a terrorism problem in this country, then you're not paying attention to what's going on in Russia because Russia has lost 60,000 of its citizens to Muslim terrorist attacks in Russia. Uh, they had the misfortune of trying to annex Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan uh, as part of the Soviet Union. Those are Muslim nations. And now they've got Chechnya, the breakaway Muslim area of Russia. They've got a Muslim terrorism problem problem that you can't imagine. And if we were having it in this country, uh, I think everything would just stop as we try to take care of it. So I see those two things. You know, money is going to drive a lot of these things. Uh, Russia, it probably has to strong arm its ability to get oil out of its own, oil and natural gas out of its own territory to ship to Western Europe. So you're probably onto something there. But I, I I, I, it's hard to pin just one of these things as the main cause. True. It probably is a combination. Uh, the combination I, I think that looks particularly the potential here to explain the, the problem is, of course, I, I think we agree, this, the warm water seaport. But money is... Pardon me? I was going to say, the level of antagonism has gone so high in the last couple of years between the United States and Russia. For 40 years, you and I were told to hate Russia because it's, you know, the, the base of godless communism. And now instead, you and I are told to hate Russia because it's the base of Orthodox Christianity, where things like homosexuality are not openly accepted the way they are in this country. So our country has some kind of knee-jerk hatred of Russia 
that we will never get over. And you've got people like John McCain who are insisting that NATO put defenses into Ukraine and Georgia and put missile defense systems there, all of which are provocative acts to the Russians. You know, McCain just does this stuff without thinking how the other party might react. And the more he opens his mouth, the further we get into trouble. So the quicker that guy loses, leaves office, the better off we'll all be in many respects. But if you read what uh, Vladimir Putin said today in the New York Times, uh, it's just given more fuel for people like McCain and uh, his ilk to get upset with comments such as from Putin today that the United States is really not all that exceptional. It, nothing gets under a pseudo-conservative skin more than a comment like that. Okay, well, it is probably a little bit irritating, but I don't this think is, it's... This, is, this, is, this is a very hard time to be a pseudo-conservative, Chris. You know, you're, you're, you're uh, war, war-thumping uh, uh, pseudo-conservative Republicans. They always want to have a war, but they hate Obama so much that they can't support this one. So they're really torn between, what do I do? Do, do I support this war? I support all wars, and John McCain is telling me to support it, but I hate, I hate Obama so much. This is a really hard time to be a pseudo-conservative in the United States. I agree. Uh, and I'm, I'm not for uh, entering uh, this war, and I think the involvement in it, if we look to our, 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 for our motivations here, uh, politics, Russia is not providing any political reason why we should be involved. Uh, the religion, we're not involved with a Shiite versus Sunni problem. Uh, it's really regional. Money, well, we don't want to involve ourselves in what other people are trying to make a buck. Certainly not this nation would certainly uh, want to intervene for somebody else making a dollar. Um, this nation was founded on on government helping business. Uh, that's the idea of the Puritans. Work, produce, receive your reward. And of course, the, the other motivation is not con uh, consequential here. So, I don't see any reason to get involved yet uh, on any level, on, uh, on self-interest level, on the aesthetic level, on ethics level, I don't see how, uh, yet uh, we see, uh, you, as you say, these, these uh, Republicans, uh, including the Wall Street Journal, advocating an entrance into this conflict. And I just, I don't see it. What do you, what do you think? Well, Chris, I mean, look at who's pushing the hardest for this war. You know, uh, when we had the Iraq war, we kept calling it Bush's war. And when we had the War of 1898, it was, you know, that splendid little war. We had Seward's Folly before that. If you read Tuesday's New York Times, uh, there's an article, the headline of which was, Lobbying Group for Israel to Press Congress on Syria. And just the, you read the first paragraph of the article, it tells you a lot, of, a lot of information here of who's pushing for this. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the powerful pro-Israel lobby in Washington, plans to dispatch 300 of, 300 of its members to Capitol Hill on Tuesday as part of a broad campaign to press Congress to back President Obama's proposed strike on Syria. Now, that's not in the American national interest. Here you have, again, an organized lobby, we've talked about this time again, uh, who are effectively what political scientists would call rent seekers, going down and manipulating the system. So maybe we should call this Apex War or Sheldon Adelson's War, because it's in the United States, 80 to 90% of the Americans do not want to get involved. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, reported that Israel is against using its forces, the Israeli public is against using its forces by a count of seven to one. However, the Israeli public votes three to one that the Americans should attack. So let's remember who's, whose ox is going to get gored and, and whose interest this is all in. Because to be honest with you, Chris, uh, you and I are no safer or more at risk whether Assad or the rebels has or does not have chemical weapons. True. I agree. You know, this it, this it is, is not conspiratorial nonsense. This is Tuesday's New York Times. I'd encourage uh, viewers to go look at it. And I, uh, I, whole, I, I wholeheartedly agree here. Uh, there's just no reason to intervene. In fact, I even find it surprising that Israel itself would want either would want us to intervene 
at all either. I, the reprisals could trigger a regional conflict, I would think. Um, uh, well, I mean, why not a global conflict? Right? Or even global let's, conflict. Let's, you yes. know, when when uh, you know when the prince was shot in June of 1914, we go back to that a lot on this show. Uh, things you know, things were not foreseeable. One thing one thing you we the, one of the few things we do learn from history is that the future is unpredictable. And if you thought that some secondary uh, royalty member getting killed, getting assassinated in a far off, far flung colonial property was going to cause 13 million dead, uh, the, the demise of three monarchies in Europe, and a complete rewriting of the geopolitical system. People would have, men in, in white suits would have come and put you in a straitjacket and taken you away. But now we know things like that can happen. So let's just imagine, you know, this conflagration cooks up, heats up, price of oil goes to $200, and China decides, you know what, we're growing, we don't have time for this crap, we're going to go in and we're just going to invade the five following countries and we're taking their oil. Those countries might get upset, nukes start flying around, next thing you know we've got World War III. Or as the neocons would say, I guess they're probably up to about World War VII by now. But be that as it may, they're, they're, this has the potential to explode into something really hideous for one reason, oil. And we will be dragged in, kicking and screaming by those 300 lobbyists who are down there right now for no reason whatsoever in the American national interest demanding that Congress support Obama in this idiotic maneuver. Well, I think you just agreed with me then. The second motivation could possibly be the petroleum or the gas lines. Uh, because obviously that plays a significant part in along with that uh, that seaport. Um, as, as yeah, that's a, but I, Chris, I, I didn't disagree with you. I, I think we, we both agree that there, this is a multi-causal thing. Any yeah. one of these things kind of flares up as the lead cause at that moment. Uh, maybe one thing we could agree on is that, you know, Russia has in its DNA the desire for a warm water port, and that will always be there, and, you know, that's always going to be underlying, and whatever happens right. to oil afterwards, who knows? That's right. So it, it, it really is, that's a, primary, that's a primary reason why Russia is there, of course, and, 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 and as a secondary cause, we'll add in the, uh, the petroleum profits that they could uh, receive in, uh, in the benefit of their exporting all the more, to Syria. All the, more reason, all the more reason for us to start fracking like crazy and to build the uh, you know, XL Keystone Pipeline across the United States. To you know, just do not, do not have to have any reason to be involved in this nonsense. Now, there is one further thing that uh, needs to be considered that's being discussed in the media, uh, is that terrorism. If we intervene, will this not help us in, in one, keeping terrorism down, and in two, putting ice on the conflict? I don't think it does either. What do you think? I, I agree with you 100%. I, you know, if, if anything, our foreign interventions have tended to uh, cause people to want to commit terrorist acts. So anybody in this country who's sympathetic to whichever side of the battle in Syria, who's in the United States, can now become a lone wolf. You know, what was, what was our role in Chechnya? What was our role that provoked these jerks in Boston to blow up the marathon? Uh, we had a small role, but my point is that the slightest bit of provocation will get these lunatics to do something silly. And a big provocation, like what we're doing right now in, uh, or what we're talking about doing right now in Syria, has a potential to really explode. You know, there was a town hall meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, where a Syrian immigrant stood up and demanded of his congressman that we take action in this war. I don't know that guy. Uh, what I do know is that if things don't go his way, he may get upset and do something stupid in this country or one of his friends. Well, I'm going to take a slight issue here. I think the provocation of terrorism emanates from, the, from what is written in the scriptural documents uh, encapsulated in the Quran. Uh, the, there's probably, I don't know, I, I've probably read 70 or 80 warlike provocations uh, in this document and and I think that's what gives the motivation because it fits within the four great motivations of man uh, religion well, being then, one can of I, can I, Chris can I ask you why don't we see more Muslim terrorism in Brazil only because probably I 
I would say that we are prominent, we are the symbol of the West. And so it first goes out to Europe and then to North America and it hasn't gone to South America nor to Asia. Oh, it has gone to Asia. There, 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 there have been horrible incidents, you know, they blew up that disco and killed over 200 people in, in Erie and Jaya. There, oh, there's been okay. horrible, yeah, yeah. horrible Southeast Asia. attacks off in, in Asia. Yeah. There, there, are ton, there are tons of terrorist attacks in China. And if you consider Russia part of Asia, which it technically is, they've lost 60,000 people since 9-11. Uh, so uh, it's there, it's everywhere. It's also, it also happens to be in South America. The uh, Israeli embassy got blown up in Buenos Aires and killed a lot of people. That was Muslim terrorism. So it's everywhere. But my question is, and you just you answered, you actually answered it for me. Uh, you know, they're starting with the with the big fish, and they're starting with the ones that get in their face and to bomb them. Uh, even though they want to, you know, kill all the infidels, you might as well start with the ones who are bombing you. So if we start bombing them, we'd be the natural target as opposed to Brazil. Okay. Um, I accept that and. But uh, at the same time, uh, wherever Muslims are is where there is the start or the seed of terrorism. As you mentioned, <laughs> Indonesia or Philippines, they're all caused by the presence of Muslims and their ideology. What about the IRA? Oh, I, I, we're not arguing that there aren't other types of uh, terrorism from other types of groups. However, uh, probably of the 30 or 35 conflicts throughout the world, uh, 29 or th to 34 of them are caused by Muslims and, their and they cite their ideology as the cause for their, uh, for their violence and for their in, uh, creating terrorism. So now I would like to go back. You know that that that's um, that will that can bring us back to something uh, that you said earlier. You said that Russia has a great amount of uh, a problem of terrorism within their borders. How would they be able to uh, to fix that problem? Uh. For, I mean, they could start by giving Chechnya its independence. I don't know why they insist on keeping it as part of the Federation. Just let them go and, you know, then draw a border and say, you ever cross this line? I have no idea. You know, we have our effeminate president, but I have no, I have no doubt in my mind that if they let Chechnya go and Putin said, try me, that if you did test him, he would come down with full force, unlike our effeminate uh, communist leader in this country. And if it and it already has started to flare up here. If it flares up further, what can we do What's about it? What's flaring up here? Terrorism. Terrorism within the borders of the United States. Of course, we haven't which, seen which? The, the likes of 9-11, but we see small incidents of terror uh, in, started by Muslims. Is there something we should do within our borders? Uh, you know, we've talked about it before. We should be a little more selective in who we allow in this country on a legal or illegal basis. There are people that we let in who don't like us. There are people we let in who hate us, who we let in legally, who we give visas to, who then jump in airplanes and fly them into skyscrapers. People like that should not even be allowed into this country. So there are people, you know, a, a nation is really uh, language, history, and culture. It's not, despite what the neocons think, it's not a proposition where you just wade across the Rio Grande spouting some nonsense about equality and that makes you, as, an, as, as American, as someone whose ancestors fought in the American Revolution. A, a nation is language, history, and culture, and we should be admitting people who are more like us linguistically, historically, and culturally. Not people who come here who hate us, who have a chip on their shoulder, and have seen the United States as, as the world's worst uh, nightmare is done nothing but oppress and rip off and screw the rest of the world. People from those kind of countries who want to jump in airplanes and fly into skyscrapers should not be allowed in this country. I agree. Uh, I agree. The ideology. Uh, maybe, maybe, ideology maybe that's a little too exclusive. Yep. Ideology is a significant part of man's motivation, and so we need 
to be friends with those who have a similar ideology of, of freedom, of natural rights, and, and I don't think the Quran uh, purports that. My reading of the Quran, I don't find any natural rights. I find violence to those outside of the world of Islam. And I would like to see that moderate or secular uh, Muslims uh, denounce this, but we haven't seen any of that. Well, Chris, remember that uh, there is no such thing as your reading of the Quran. Uh, the Quran in Islam is the immutable word of the Prophet. These words are not up for interpretation. So your reading of it can be no different than my reading of it. There is no exegetical analysis of it the way that Jews and Christians do with their holy scripture. It is the word of the Prophet. It is not up for discussion and it is immutable. It cannot be changed. So it is accepted at face value. The only interpretation is exactly what says there. There is no such thing as, you know, Talmudic discussion or biblical exegesis. This is the word of the prophet not to be messed with. So your interpretation, uh, there's no such thing as Chris Angle's interpretation of what I said. There's no such thing as Mark Brennan's interpretation of what I said. It is the word of the prophet. It is not up for discussion. I agree. That's, uh, that's right out of the history, uh, right out of the Quran and right out of the uh, Hadith and right into the interpretation. Yeah, they, they, Go ahead. They, they missed the Enlightenment. They, they missed, uh, you know, the better parts of secular humanism that came in and helped us refine the Judeo-Christian tradition. They missed that. That's right. Mark, I want to thank you for joining us. It's been a great discussion. And I want to thank our audience for viewing. We'll see you next week on The Philosophical Angle.